dear, how you been? The best dad joke in the world. Okay, Acts 15. No joke. Turn there if you would. Acts 15 is where we're going to be. It's good to see you guys. Thank you for participating in our Christmas services. Christmas Eve was amazing. Standing room only. Christmas Day, not so much, but a good crowd. Best part of all, Jesus was proclaimed. The gospel was shared. People were, uh, people were moved. We're praying that uh, seeds have been planted. So, so appreciate the band and uh, my fellow presenters, speakers that brought the gospel uh, along with me that night and, and that morning. And uh, just great, great to serve with the church and uh, just excited to be with you guys today. Um, Acts 15. So just when you thought, it's like, oh, maybe Pastor Scott's going to do a different series. Nope, we're still in Acts. We didn't get done with it, so uh, this will be our mission for this year. Maybe get done with Acts. Who knows? It go, could go into 2024 if the Lord should not tarry, right? right? He could come back at any moment, but Acts 15 is where we're going to be. And, and I think an important topic for this year. Um, so we had some deaths recently. Pele, um, famous soccer player, amazing. And some didn't know a great actor as well. Cool movie called Victory. You guys remember the movie Victory with Sylvester Sloan Pele and Michael Caine? Cool soccer movie set in World War II, Nazi Germany. Interesting. Um, Mar- Barbara Walters died. Uh, famous, uh, known for interviews. Incredible journalist. Um, Pope Benedict passed away. He's the one I want to kind of talk about for a moment. Pope Benedict. Uh, retired. Like, when do you get to retire as a pope? So he retires, and uh, to a lot of people, that was probably the best move because they didn't like Pope Benedict. Pope Francis comes in. We like Pope Francis. Well, some don't like Pope Francis. Who likes Pope Francis? Who likes Pope Benedict? How do we decide? Why did division? Why did division? Pope Francis, current pope, is known for his mercy. Write that word down, mercy. Having grown up in South America and familiar with the plight of so many that have so little, Pope Francis can identify with the common person. People love Pope Francis because of his emphasis on on grace and love and mercy. See, what people didn't like about Pope Benedict, he was about moral reform. Write down that word, reform. You hear the word reform, it's like you better get your act together. He was about ethics. He was about morals. People liked Pope Benedict. They were a little bit more on the truth and less on the grace, whereas people with Francis are more on the grace and less with the truth. It's interesting how the world tries to put us in categories and polarize us. Who's on Pope Francis' team? Who's on Pope Benedict's team? Who's on Pope Jacob's team? Who's on Team Jacob? Stop. Don't even go there. We live in a world where there's these pendulum swings. And if it's not fighting over the popes, what are we fighting over? What, what sort of groups do try to polarize us and have us pick a side? Come on, name them. Political. Republicans. No, Democrats. You know, there's, there's no happy middle. You just got to pick a side, stick with that side, fight for that side. How else are we polarized? What, what other extremes do we experience in this world? Sports. Hannah. What? Describe for us. Oh. That cuts deep, Shrek. That cuts real deep. Who's got a better record this year? That's all I got to say. Who's got a better record this year? What quarterback are they on? Number six, seven? How many quarterbacks do they need to go through? Guy that you never heard of playing today, David Blow, Blow, whatever you pronounce it. God bless him. What else? How else are we polarized? Immigration. Pick a side. Could there be this thing called compromise? Write down that word. Compromise. See, La- Marsha. Are you worthy? Expand. Okay. Hmm. Okay. 
We might touch on a little bit of that today. Did you read my notes ahead of time? <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about that. So, yeah. Pro-life, pro-choice. Pro -life, pro Waleed, first time here. Welcome. I would have you remove your hat, but you know what? I'm going to be gracious to you. You got it. Okay, this side of the spectrum, write down the word legalism. So that's one of those in-house kind of battles, right? And the emphasis is on works. So much so that legalism, when it has its, it breeds its perfect fruit, it yields guilt. Yay, no, no yay. <laughs> what are you talking about? Fresh back from Seattle, look at the weather you brought with it. So you have over here legalism, right, with its emphasis on works, and the impact is guilt. If you don't achieve, you're a failure. That's what it preaches. It destroys freedom. Pendulum swings this side. What do we have? License. With an emphasis on self. Do whatever makes you happy. You do you. Its emphasis is on self, and the impact is offense. How you live offends me. You're so open-minded. You're so liberal. Legalism destroys freedom, licenses, abuses freedom. Is there a balance between those two things? I'm going to call it love. Love. See, there's nothing wrong with works just as long as we all agree that you're saved by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. And then what happens as a result of this new faith that God starts and continues in you, you bring forth works. But works don't play into whether you ultimately get to heaven or not. Jesus already paid that ticket. Amen? So there's nothing wrong with emphasizing on works as long as we don't allow there to be this works-based mentality that, that destroys freedom. License, once we're in Christ, there's incredible freedom. But sometimes we can take that freedom to unhealthy extremes. What's the balance? It's called love. Love is the essence of the Christian life. It celebrates freedom and while it doesn't destroy freedom and it doesn't lead to divisiveness in the church, it has this heart that says, I am going into deeper devotion with God and with other people. Here's the good news. Today, I'm not going to make you choose sides when it comes to how our faith is practically lived out in our lives. Though we live in such tenuous times, me as a pastor over these past few years have had to wear hats I did not anticipate. If you think about my role as a pastor, what sort of titles would you attribute with pastor? Counselor. I've done, I've done plenty of that. What else? Shepherd. What is it? Shepherd. Shepherd. What else? Teacher. What is it? CEO. CEO. Well, thank you, Michael LaGrasso. <laughs> what else? Okay, living test model for better or for worse. Thank you. Yeah. So we can fill in the blank. Here's one I bet no one would ever think of. You ready for it? Referee. No way did I see that on the job description. But these past few years, I have had to be a referee of situations outside the church, of situations within the church, and even those that straddle both worlds. A referee. And a referee plays with two teams that have equal presence in the game or multiple players in the game. And a referee tries to find some common ground. You could say that a referee is almost like a mediator, moderator, but I like referee. And today, I guess I'm going to play the role of referee. And today, I want to perhaps... Give you a word for 2023. Now, this is funny because I don't, I don't do this, but my wife the other day is like, what's your word of the year? And I was like going, you've never asked me that. I've never chosen a word for the year. 
you're not, it's not that you don't love Jesus if you choose a word for the year, but I'm just not into that, you know, because people are like, inspiration, that's my word for the year. Like, good, go for it. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> grace, acceptance, you know, whatever it is. But after thinking about it, the word that I've been thinking about and convicted by personally this past year may serve us well, not just this next this year, but several years to come, and it's the word submission. Because here's one thing as a referee that I haven't seen largely modeled in the church is a spirit of submission. You know what we're really good about doing is digging in our heels and standing for our side. You know what we're really good in is standing up for our right. Side message, another time, but I'll give you just a little teaser right now. You have no right as a fallen, sinful creature before a holy God. I don't know what these rights are you speak of. You don't have any. Perhaps that's where our founding fathers created a culture that we're feeling the, the intensity on this. You have no rights. And yet what rights, privileges... Liberties, freedoms that you do have to some degree at some level. How do you use those? How do you use those things? Because I really believe we are on the precipice of, of the church needing to model submissiveness to people. Did not God model this? who in Philippians 2 says he emptied himself, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but came and he not only came to be with us, but he took the lowest form among us, a servant. I hear submission. And maybe we have lost the heart of Christ, who himself said the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Acts 15 has a word for us. It's amazing how many people I admire in ministry, pastors, writers, speakers, pass over this chapter. It's like, let's, let's not deal with it because there's better things. And yet, I, I think this chapter is so pivotal in what God's doing that we, we need to stop and look at this and go, what, why is this here? God has given us this. Why? Because I think it, con it confronts us. It challenges us. It, it forces us to go, how selfish am I? How self-focused am I? How self-absorbed am I? And what lengths would I go to? Even if giving up my rights, my freedoms, my privileges to see someone else come to know Jesus and grow in Christ. Acts 15. Turn there in your Bibles if you would. Starting at verse 19, um, we're going we're gonna to revolve around grace, which I believe is the opposite side of the same coin as love. You know, love manifests itself in a lot of ways. I think grace is probably one of the most powerful demonstrations of love. Uh, the early church has just got done debating how you are saved. There's a group that came into the church and said, oh, you're saved by grace plus works. It's Jesus plus something, and I'm going to tell you right now, every day today, and even days that end in Y, and twice on Sunday, until the day I die and meet my maker face to face, I will preach this Jesus plus nothing. That's salvation. We add nothing. You are saved by grace alone and faith alone through Christ alone. That's it. Amen? The moment we add something, we, we, we botch up the gospel, and we're headed to ruin and destruction. So the church... Last time we were in Acts, dealt with this. There's a group that came in and said, no, you need to re require circumcision from the Gentiles. 
And the church, starting with Peter and then Paul and Barnabas and then James, all stand up and said, nope, we are unified on this. You are saved by grace alone. But there are other matters we need to deal with. Whereas it may not be a theological hindrance, saved by works, grace plus works, there are practical hindrances, not having to do necessarily with faith, but with fellowship that we need to be aware of. Verse 19. Therefore, James says, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. Stop putting barriers in the road. Stop hindering people from seeing Christ and tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Amen? We need to remove all obstacles. We need to remove all barriers. Whatever is required for Christ to be lifted up and for all men and women to be drawn to him, we need to make sure that path is clear. Amen, church? We could go home just on that, but we're not going to. Verse 20. But we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. Four restrictions they put upon the Gentile believers, new Gentile believers. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city who has been preached him since he is read in the synagogues of every Sabbath, right? There's this law of Moses that says, be careful what you eat and be careful how you conduct yourself sexually. So yes, we get to talk about two topics today, perhaps two of my favorite topics, eating and sex. But we will keep it PG, amen, parents? Verse 22. So it seemed good to the apostles and to the elders that the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch. Antioch is where the hubbub started that you are saved by faith and works. So Antioch says we're having trouble with this group that's saying you're saved by faith in Christ plus circumcision. They send Paul and Barnabas to the church of Jerusalem. There in Jerusalem they settle the matter. So with one mind, they're of one accord, with one faith, believe in one Jesus, one spirit, one baptism. They send a group back saying we are unified in this message. You are saved by faith alone. You don't have to add circumcision to it. So Paul, Barnabas, Judas, Silas, leading men among the brethren, here's the letter. The apostles and the brethren who are elders and the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Amicable, gracious, nice. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words unsettling your souls. This is the group saying you are saved plus, by faith plus works. We got the message. We settled it. Verse 25, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a question to you. Who are you risking your life for so that they've come to know Jesus? I think we probably think a little too casually about how we represent Jesus. How many of you have even risked your life for the gospel? Wow. I don't even know what that is. And maybe that is part of my experience of not understanding the passion that these men had, making sure that every single person just somehow knew about Jesus. Risking their lives for Christ? So we sent you, Judas, Silas, themselves. So here's the beautiful thing, because verse 28 is what we're going to circle around. The church is unified, so they send representatives from not just the church at Antioch, but the church at Jerusalem, saying we're of one mind on this. We are going to promote unity. We are going to promote harmony. And then verse 28. You guys ready for this? I don't know if you are. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. That you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. Talk about a mic drop. Hey, stop strangling animals and uh, having sex, all right? Like, is that really what they're saying? No. Here's what they're doing. They're dealing with two fundamental things that every human being universally does, eat and has sex. 
Pretty amazing, huh? We're establishing common ground. Is there anything wrong with eating? No. Is there anything wrong with sexy time? No. But both things can be used and abused. Both things can be done without an eye to the glory of God or the good of other people. Verse 30. So when they were sent away, went down to Antioch, having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. So, hey, church, come together. We got some news. And they read the letter, and the people rejoiced because of the encouragement. What? Yay! What were they celebrating? They're celebrating a unified body of Christ. They're celebrating the fact that we have some disagreements, but in love and with grace, we can work through it. And be used now of God to reach more and more people because Satan's not having his divisive effect in our churches. And Judas and Silas stayed around loving the church and they spent time there and it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas, verse 35, stayed in Antioch teaching and preaching with many are also, also uh, the word of the Lord. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts today. Four topics. First one is this, real quick. Just in, le- just in case no one got it, The basis of salvation is grace alone, not the law. Amen? We are saved by grace alone and faith alone in Christ alone. So that is the message of verse 19. James says we don't want to throw anything in the pathway. Uh, It is by grace alone. And so uh, the theological truth wins the day, but not at the expense of love. Can I tell you a statement that I've held on to for years that I I think is so appropriate in this context? The shift is now from convictions to consciences. We're going to move now from this realm of being right to now being in relationship. See, what we have to learn as believers is that we live in contexts where people are going to have different opinions than us. They're going to have different perspectives than us. They're going to have different views on things. Perhaps the one verse that God didn't give us in the Bible that if I was to add, which could be a dangerous thing, but I'm not going to, I'm just going to say this, where two or three are gathered, there shall be division. Where two or three are gathered, thou shalt be contentious debate. Second Hesitations, chapter 4. See, we've lost the heart of what I shared two weeks ago, and it's the phrase, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. You need that again? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Because here's what the law does. It obligates, but here's what the gospel does. It liberates. And I want us to think about our liberties and our freedoms that are found in Christ Jesus and how that has to do with our fellowship. We've established the faith piece. You are saved by Jesus, and there's no works added on to the perfect work he's already done. We're in agreement on that. Now, how does that work itself out into our fellowship? How does that work itself out into our relationships? I'm not concerned about the theological things right now. I'm concerned about how we live this out in practice. And I'm going to yield to you this. Submission and service to one another. Point number two. So I told you it was going to go fast. The fruit of salvation is love, not license. I would even venture to say that when you find the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, that the, the, the lead of love there is the main fruit and all those other fruit are manifestations of love. So if, if love is the thing, then we need to be careful that that love doesn't turn into license, right, to do whatever we want. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, right? But now you are saved not to live any life you want to live. You live a life that is honoring to the Lord that has saved you. And now you walk in a manner worthy of your calling in Christ Jesus, Colossians chapter 4. Holiness becomes such an important part of our journey. 
right? There's some that would say, you know, I'm good. I've got my ticket stamped for heaven. Now I can live life however I want. God saved me for heaven. Now I can live my life like hell. There's people that say, I've accepted Jesus as, Lord, as Savior, but I'm not sure if I'm going to accept him as Lord. It's not an option. It's a package deal. He is Savior and he is Lord. Lordship means he now has ownership of your life. So we need to talk about sensitivities to others' sensibilities. You like that? That's good, isn't it? We need to understand what it means to be sensitive to others' sensibilities. And there's a difference in this topic, because we're not talking about law, we're talking about prudence. What does prudence mean? It means I must live a life with discernment. I live a life that says there are people different than me. How am I aware of their differences? And rather than understanding where I'm coming from, because doggone it, you need to understand me. That's not the way of Christ. The way of Christ is saying, help me understand you. So you have the Jewish community. So the Jews live in these incredibly restrictive, rigid environments. There's rules. There's laws. There's moral and ethical codes. So the Jewish believers have been raised this environment. And there's a lot of rules, 613 rules. You remember this? And they had to abide by them all. Talk about guilt. The Gentiles lived in a context where there were no rules. How many of you are like, woohoo? like they don't understand like oh I shouldn't eat that and I shouldn't sleep with that and I shouldn't look at that and I shouldn't kill like they don't know these things so now you get a group who's incredibly restrictive and rigid and rule based and you get this group that has total license and there are no, no rules and you do you do you what if these two groups came together and had to hang out and love one another I can tell you what's going to happen conflict conflict. Notice the prohibitions listed here. Eating and sex. The eating one kind of changes. It's, it's more like a, a, a custom, a cultural context custom. You found the best steaks in town. Where do you go for the best steak? People go to the temple. Because the temple was the place where they brought the best meat. They sacrificed it to their God. They believed that their God inhabited the meat somehow, some way. It was a temporary offering. And once that meat had done its purpose on the altar, it was sold to the steakhouse right next door. And then people go, we're going to go eat that meat. You don't want to waste meat. Meat was a precious commodity. People couldn't afford meat. But you wanted the best steak, you go to the temple. That, had just been, that meat had just been offered to a God. Good news is God says, you want meat? Go eat it. What's your favorite steak? Ribeye? Filet mignon? You guys getting hungry? Don't worry, I won't tease you anymore. I would say it's a, it's a cultural context ceremonial issue. It's not that it's not important, but I don't think it's as binding as perhaps the sexual mandate. And let me be clear. The dietary restriction is a universal restriction. It actually predates Moses. It goes back to Genesis chapter 9 that you shall not eat the meat that has blood in it because God says life is found in the blood. Make sure you honor the sacrifice. Make sure you drain it completely. God says, I want this to be just a universally accepted thing. Weird pagan cultures would sometimes drink blood, and Jewish people found that so distasteful, so ugly, so crude. But sex, what does God have to say about sex? Is it a you-do-you kind of world? I'm going to tell you right now. Here's the rule for sex. You guys ready for this? This is all we're going to talk about when it comes to the sex talk. Sex is permissible and honoring to God when you experience the sexual intimacy with someone of the opposite sex in the context of marriage. Full stop, period. Don't you love how simple God is? And yet we complicate it. But God, it feels so good. No, I'm not talking about your feelings. Thank goodness we don't, we're not led by our feelings, or maybe we are, and that's why you're in so much trouble. Context. Sex, to, God says you save it for marriage, and you save it for marriage with someone of the opposite sex. And then have the time of your life. Amen? Sex is God's idea. You guys realize this. This is his idea. 
and he's created us uniquely to share that sexual experience with someone that's different than us, wired than us. The plumbing is different between us, amen? But you don't do it recklessly. You save it for the context of marriage because sex is most beautiful when it's in a context of commitment. I'm saving some of you from a lifetime of headache and heartache. Yes, you have urges. Yes, you have desires. Yes, you have pleasures and impulses. But there's this thing called self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit. And until you are married and spending time with someone of the opposite sex, abstain. Flee sexual immorality. And notice I'm saying it with a smile on my face. It's God's idea. And anytime you practice sex out of that context, it will always lead to a miserable experience. Whether you taste it now or not, it will lead to a miserable experience. Are we clear? No? Do you want me to talk about sex more? Okay, no, we're not going to. I love you guys, and I just want you to do well. So conflict, eating, sacrifice, idolatry, the temple, blood, sex, strangling animals, weird The Jews are coming to the table with Gentiles, and what they need to learn most of all is patience. They were here before the Gentiles. (laughs) They're in on what God wants before the Gentiles, and they are learning patience because they got this group of people that are just hog wild. What are the Gentiles needing to learn? Sensitivity. Sensitivity. So Lori and I met... Um, in high school, Horizon High School, go Huskies. Class of 88, she was class of 89. Paula Weber was class of 87. We got the trifecta. So I meet Lori in high school. Now understand, I was a new believer. She had been a believer in Christ for, for at least a decade at that point. Um, we were friends after high school started dating, and it was interesting because she came to the table more like a Jew, and I came to the table more like a Gentile. She grew up in a household that knew Jesus, and she came to know Jesus at a young enough age where she was raised within certain environments where she was taught the things of God. I didn't have that. We had not Jesus, but Barry Manilow. That's how I'm ruined. Neil Diamond, Creedence Clearwater Revival, right? She's got some gospel singers, and I've got the doors, you know, touch me, baby, right? Like, so we meet, and we start romantically getting involved, and what's interesting is we were like oil and water. And and I would say even still to this day, 30 years of marriage, There are things she came to the table with and we argued over. And there are things I brought to the table that we fought over. Matter of fact, her parents had incredible concern for us because we were always bickering and debating with each other. And her mom was like, are you guys going to be all right? Are you going to make it? We fought through it. And we came to some amazing conclusions. There's things that we came to agreement on. There's things that even today we don't agree eye to eye on. So I could say in a way that Lori was used by God to bring things to the surface in my heart and and, and come to her side and understanding some things. In, In a little bit more of the, hey, you know what? This is what the word says and this is what the gospel promotes and this is what would honor Jesus. And and me going, you know, you're right. And gentlemen, If you're married, or even if you're in a serious relationship, sometimes the voice of God sounds like your wife's voice. Amen? Now, granted, there are things that I challenge her with, and she's come to my side of things. You know, I'm the one that, you know, she's like, hey, listen to Amy Grant. I'm going, hey, let's listen to, you know, Led Zeppelin. And it's okay, you're not going to lose your soul. Amen? When was the last time you heard Amy Grant and Led Zeppelin mention the same sentence? Yeah. They should tour together. That would be pretty amazing. <laughs> Never happened, but that's okay. So what I'm saying is this. Even within our most intimate relationships, you've got to figure out a way to talk and compromise. 
Here's the good news. We weren't fighting over the deity of Christ. We weren't fighting over the resurrection of Christ. We weren't fighting over being saved by grace alone. We were debating over preferences. choices, liberties, freedoms, whatever word you want to use, and trying to come to some conclusion where we can still accept one another and love one another and celebrate not the things we agree on, but even celebrate the things we don't agree on. See, this not only now becomes a principle of liberties, it actually becomes a principle of love. I'm going to call it the law of love because at the end of the day, love shall prevail. Amen? Amen? Think about the things we fight about today. These may or may not include some of the things Lori and I have fought about over the years. Tattoos, homeschooling, alcohol, entertainment, foods, masks, vaccines, politics, yoga, meditation, Halloween, Christmas traditions, working on Sunday, credit cards, divorce, gambling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of those topics I mentioned are hills I am personally going to die on. Though, I have met people where I thought, that is a hill you're going to die on. And part of me inside goes, God help us. Think about this. Some verses I'm going to give you. And I'm going to have some people read. So, um, Christina, can I have you pass out? So I've got four passages of Scripture here. Um, if you want to stand up and read one of these passages, just raise your hand. And this is, this is fun. This is what the body of Christ is all about. Paula, thank you. Raise your hand. I see that hand. Yeah, going once, going twice. Right? I got to go to First Corinthians chapter eight. Who's going to raise your hand? And when I call upon you, you're going to stand up and read the passage. Because here's what I didn't know. Okay, thirty-five years in ministry, I was struck this week by how much what we're talking about right now is found throughout the New Testament. Paul makes this such a pivotal point in his letters. Stop trying to be right and stay in relationship. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Look what this says. Paul writes, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You've been set free not for yourself, but you have been set free so that you can somehow serve somebody else. Is this not consistent with the Spirit of Christ? Who, again, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and came and took on the form of a servant. And he himself says, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. How, how often is this taught in our discipleship as new believers in Christ Jesus? As much as Osteen sells a lot of books, I don't agree, your best life now. You know, as much as Rick Warren says, you know, in the chapter of the Purpose Driven Life, it, you know, it's not about you, the whole book then begins to be about you. Perhaps the greatest road you can be on as a disciple forever and ever and ever is the road of self-forgetfulness. Here's what Paul says. You have freedom. Stop thinking about how you're going to use that freedom for you. Use it to serve one another. So you're saying, I don't like Paul, I like Peter. Well, guess what? I got some Peter for you. Live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So Peter, Paul, there's a message of serving. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, he says this. Here's one lesson I've learned. And it's a little bit washed out, but it's okay. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. What does that mean? It means you can do whatever you want, but not everything you choose to do is going to be helpful for either you or somebody else. Wow. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Wait, did we not just say that? You know what Paul does? He mentions it twice in one letter. It's like when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly. When someone says something twice, it's like, hey, pay attention. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Side note, let me get in my little preacher box real quick. 
There's people who will talk about stuff more than they talk about Jesus. And as much as they say they love Jesus, the more they talk about the stuff, the stuff is really the idol in their lives. They can take a stance on an issue, and it just seems like that's everything they talk, that's their hobby horse issue. This is why we exist, for this issue. And when there's more of the issue being discussed than Jesus, the issue is really the God in their life. Stop. Stop. You are dominated by that thing. May the love and grace of Christ compel you that it's Jesus and Jesus only that you preach. I'm not saying you don't have conversations about other things, but just stop making that the world you revolve around. What a beautiful thing it is to limit our freedom. Two points I want to talk about real quick. Limiting our freedom for God shows sanctity. So I've already talked about this, the importance of holiness. I want you guys to grow in godliness. I want you to pursue righteousness. The choices you make on a day-to-day basis are important. They're going to form you. They're going to shape you. They're going to influence you. But there's things that we pick up in the world, this thing that's called contamination, right? Sometimes we allow the world's influence a little too much leeway and, and leverage in our lives And I'm going to tell you right now, I want to pursue holiness. I want to walk in a manner worthy of my calling in Christ Jesus. I want you to pray for my holiness. I want you to pray that God is glorified in the things I look at, the things I listen to, the things that I I obsess over, the things I allow my heart to grab a hold of, the the things I allow my mind to entertain. We're all confronted with things that are trying to woo us away from the beauty and treasure that is Jesus. May we ratchet up steps of growing in holiness and pursuing righteousness in our lives. Bible memorization, reading the scripture, less time on social media, more time in the word, less time on streaming movies and TV, and more time in the word. What are you saturating your heart and minds with? I'm going to limit my freedom. Yes, in Christ, I can do whatever I want to do, but why would I want to do anything that interrupts the life that he has so won and bought and paid for for me? Sanctity is a desire to say, I am set apart. I am different. And I'm not going to do things just because everyone else does them. I'm doing things for the sake of my own soul. Because what does it profit you if you do things just like the world does and yet you lose your soul? There needs to be more of a severity of pursuing holiness in our lives. So much so, this is why the words of Jesus are so haunting. And some of us are so quickly to, to erase them. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, guess what? Give it a soft, give it a soft slap. You know what he says? He says, get the machete. Some of you are like, that's in the word? It is. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Do not come in next week bleeding, <laughs> bleeding and, and, and only vi- looking at one eye, right? Like, there are some things that, that we need to take metaphorically. But what Jesus is saying, you need to be intense, right? The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life. You know, the things we, you can control what comes in. But once that thing enters, it's going to do a work on your heart. And the evidence then is in your actions and behaviors and attitudes. Be careful. Be careful. What am I willing to say no to? What freedom am I willing to limit so that my walk with God is enhanced? Second thing is this, limiting my freedom for others shows maturity. So I'm going to say to God, I'm going to do whatever it takes so I can walk with you unadulterated, uninterrupted, undistracted, right? Like, I want to be focused upon you, Lord, intense. But then there's this freedom that I'm called to limit in my life because I want you to do well, I want you to excel. I want you to grow. And when I defer to you, and it's less about my convictions and more about your conscience, it shows maturity. 
When you're considering others as more important than yourself, when you're thinking of others as more important than yourself, that shows maturity. You're actually evidencing the spirit of Jesus who says, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. What can I do for you? Paul, Peter, James, John, they're celebrating this. And they're, they're so thorough in their writings to say, maturity is not so much in what you know, it's how you live. And are you living for others? How may perhaps God be asking you to limit your freedom for the sake of somebody else? What privileges are you willing to forgo so that someone else is able to grow and flourish in their life? Because I'm going to tell you right now, that's where harmony grows and flourishes. Point number three. And then let me just say the last point we're going to go through real quick. So this is where we're going to hang out. Application. The posture of salvation or posture of salvation is what? Submission, not grace, uh, not selfishness. So let me say a word about submission real quick. Because the moment you hear that word submission, you immediately think marriage and you go, well, that's the wife's role, right? And you look at Ephesians chapter 5, and men like, are like, look, you do this. I'm going to tell you right now. If you're a husband that goes to your wife and says, you're supposed to do this, you're not a Christ-like husband. You don't, you don't do that. Submission is not a wife's role in marriage. Some of you have, have learned that, and it has ruined so many lives. Submission is a response to a husband's role of servant leadership. Men, you don't demand submission. Submission is cultivated when you lead in love like Christ in your house. If you demand submission, you don't understand the heart of Jesus. But as a woman, when you feel like you're being led by Christ, however imperfectly, you want to submit. But I'm going to tell you right now, some women are in marriages where guys don't love and lead like Jesus, and yet you're still called to respond with a spirit of submission, which makes it more difficult. And this is where the word is clear, and it says, your ultimate submission is actually not even to your husband, it's to the Lord Jesus. And somehow through your obedience to him, your husband may be convicted because his attitude or poor behavior is not affecting you because your heart's set on Christ. And somehow maybe he's going to get convicted through your holy, sanctified behavior. Right? So I think that that's an appropriate word because here's what I want to say is that submission is just not a wife's response. I'm going to tell you right now, submission is the heart of a church culture. Because even before Paul in Ephesians 5 gets to that passage about husbands and wives, here's what he says in verse 21 in Ephesians 5. Mutually, therefore, submit to one another. It's so easy to fly by that, isn't it? Because why? We have this anti-authority basis in our heart. You're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to be the captain of my soul, the master of my fate the determiner of my destiny, however you want to phrase it. And I sit there and go, good luck with that. Let me know how that works out for you. We are all submissive to Christ, who is the head of the church, and even, therefore, to one another, your leaders, your shepherds, your deacons, leadership in the church. But how beautiful it would be for community to submit to one another gladly, joyfully, exuberantly. I just had to use that word because it's such a great word. Your posture is one of submission, not selfishness. What does that look like? Well, rather than me describing it to you, let's look at the plethora. Senor, what is a plethora? We're going to look at a plethora of verses. Who's got Romans chapter 14? Paul Weber. Stand up, nice, clear voice. Here's what I want you to do. With as little commentary as possible... Just listen to the word in Romans and in Corinthians, what it says. Listen to this. Romans 14 and 3, verses 15 through 20. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your minds not to put a stumbling block or an obstacle in the way of the cross of Christ. We present, then, those who struggle in every way that nothing is of any appearance in itself. But if anyone regards something as unattained, then so 
the last question is the only question. If your brother or sister is distressed because of a dispute that you, you are no longer acting in love, do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. And therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil either. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Mm. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and reaching human approval. Therefore, turn unto love, therefore, and make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat something that causes someone else to stumble. Mm. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that makes your conscience appear to be guilty. Mm. Romans 14. It even goes into chapter 15, but you can read it later. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Who's got that? Nice and loud, Alicia. Thank you. Whoa. That's intense. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. God is not impressed by your smarts. He's impressed by your hearts. I just made that up. He doesn't want your knowledge. He wants your service. I remember going to a men's retreat one time, and there were probably 10 guys sitting around, and we were talking theology that would have made Luther and Calvin and all Spurgeon just be like, you guys are amazing. Like, and at, some, at one point I said, hey, how does that translate into loving others? Hey, so-and-so, when was the last time you sh- shared Jesus with somebody? And I went around that circle, and of all ten guys that were so knowledgeable in the word, they had not shared Jesus with a single person in as long as they could remember. And you know what I said? This stinks. Like I want to sit around in our little spiritual ivory towers and talk about, oh, you know, antinomianism, whatever. How are you loving people with the love of Christ? I'm not, I'm not saying those topics are not important. But if all we're going to do around is hang out in our holy huddles and talk about $10 theological terms and have not love, your faith is a clanging gong. Maybe that's me. I don't know. 1 Corinthians 9. You guys thought Corinthians was done. Well, we got 9, and we got 10. Who's got Corinthians 9? Delane, thank you.
There's someone I love dearly who had to wrestle with getting vaccinated to enter a country that required vaccination, and she's going to take the vaccination even though she doesn't agree with the vaccination because she wants to share the love of Jesus with those people. She's sitting right there. My daughter. Would you be willing to become a Democrat to hang out with Democrats so that somehow they can taste and see that the Lord is good? Would you, would you do that? Because if not, I'm willing to say that your politics is the God of your life. Would you become a Republican so that you can enter Republican circles and have conversations with people? And here's the thing. Democrats don't all agree with Democrats. Republicans don't all agree with Republicans. Would you be willing to go to a Taylor Swift concert, even though you're a Metallica fan? <laughs> so that somehow those young people would hear the gospel. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, your preference is hard rock, not T-Swift. I don't even know how to categorize it. What are you willing to, to do, embrace, restrict, so that the gospel is that, that prominent driving force in your life? 1 Corinthians 10. Douglas, you got it? Good. Because, you know, we need male representation here reading these things. So thank you, ladies. Ma uh, Doug. 1 Corinthians 10, 15 through 16. Therefore, those who are weak in the Lord are weak in the Lord. Amen. I mean, we can go on and on and on. But these are huge chunks of the New Testament with this driving heart behind it that says, put aside your convictions and dig in deep to understand someone else's conscience. Your convictions are fine. But it's your care for someone's conscience that is a kingdom value. Write that down. That's a kingdom value. Paul would say in Corinthians 13, right? Like, if you have the tongue of angels and speak the tongue of angels and have not love, your, your tongue of angels is a clanging, noisy sound. Right? We tend to prop up all this stuff, but when love is gone or absent... It, it matters nothing. So two, two application points. Number one is surrender. So here's your word of the year. Put aside inspiration and embrace surrender. 
How are you going to restrict your liberties knowing it's going to be a burden on you? Here's a, here's, a, here's a crazy thing when it comes to spiritual walk. And no one taught me this as far as discipleship. Yes, Christ takes our burdens, amen? And we are saved. We're no longer guilty. We are set free. We're forgiven. God takes our sins. He gives us Jesus' righteousness. That burden's been removed, amen? Amen. Peter says, cast all your burdens on the Lord, right? There's the things that cause us anxiety and stress, and we give them to the Lord. But there's a burden in life that you are called to embrace. Matter of fact, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What burden will you take upon yourself in restricting some freedom, right, privilege, because you have surrendered that this is not about you, this is about somebody else? It's a good question. When was the last time you read an article, read a book, went to a conference where they said, hey, we're going to talk about embracing burdens and taking more burdens upon your life. The more burdens you take for the sake of somebody else leads to more blessings that are experienced in the fellowship of the church and beyond. Point number two, serving. Pursuing your needs is going to be a blessing to you. I will restrict my life and it will be a burden, but I will gladly embrace that burden so to be a blessing to you. Scott Morgan, new believer, age 15, August 15, 1985. God saves me, two-story house, North, North Phoenix, I have no clue what it means to be a Christian. Men take me under their arms to disciple me, to invest in me. But there's still this awkwardness in how Scott Morgan goes to church on Sunday mornings. My mom has passed away. My dad is spiraling down this emotional loop because he doesn't understand what it means to now not have a wife and not have a mom to his kids. I'm driving myself to church, and here's how I'm driving myself to church. I was a kind of a punk skater, surfer kind of guy. Even though I didn't skate, didn't surf, I liked that image. <laughs> so all the colors of Benetton and my Varnay glasses and my cool tank top and my hot pink skater shorts, right, were usually accompanied by no shoes at all. I would go to church, no shoes, skater shorts, tank top, a bandana on my head, and walk in there looking like all oh, like surfer, skater, California life, right? Until one day an old man, older man pulled me aside and said, hey, listen, um, I love the fact you dress the way you do. But the way you're dressing is actually disturbing some of the hearts of some of the older people at church. I went to a conservative church. A lot of blues, a lot of grays. And part of me celebrated the fact that, like, hey, I know Jesus, and I can live like this. And, and, and part of me actually kind of thrived off, like, knowing people probably didn't dig what I was wearing. But the Holy Spirit, through this man, struck a chord in my heart and made it obvious to me that what I shouldn't be celebrating is the fact that I can wear whatever I want, no shoes to church, and that my presence and my liberties is somehow disrupting what God wants to do in someone else's heart. So I went out and bought a pair of flow hose. You guys remember flow hose? <laughs> Plastic, rubbery, whatever. Like, hey, they were shoes, right? And eventually I got rid of the shorts and eventually I got rid of the tank tops. Does God care about what we wear? No. But because of the fellowship and me not wanting to be a hindrance to what God was doing in someone else's heart, I wanted to make it easy for those people to worship God. So I restricted my freedoms because I wanted to be a blessing to this church. That was in so many ways a blessing to me. That's just a small example, right? Right? I'm a college pastor. People are smoking behind the Baptist church. Number one, smoking, yeah, maybe not the best for your health, but at a Baptist church, that's as close to the gates of hell as you could possibly get. <laughs> and there are people in the church like, uh, we heard, you know, we had goths and we had punks and we had, you know, all sorts of people we were ministering to. I went to a goth club. So this is where I, I took a note from Paul's playbook and said, I'm going to be all things all, all, you know, be all things all people. He said, hey, you want to go to this 3 a.m. goth party in Mesa? 
And I go, sure. And I go, what do I wear? He goes, I don't know. You know, you got a leather vest? I said, yeah. He didn't tell me about something maybe underneath. I didn't wear anything underneath. It looked like I was attending a gay village people party <laughs> and not, not a goth rave or whatever. I went. I looked awkward. It was horrible. You know, vest, no shirt, tight pants. Yeah, this guy was so cool. Me, I don't know. I, I'm just there like going, hey, guys, I'm his pastor, right? Like, um, but it was interesting because the church was like, Scott, you know what? There were hundreds of college students coming to know Christ, growing in Christ. And all the church could bicker about was like, hey, we heard people were smoking behind the church. And part of me, you know, that rebellious part of me, no shirts, pink, pink skater pants was like, are you really concerned over their smoking and you're not concerned about their soul? But God said, stop, don't do that. And I said, I hear what you're saying. And I went to this group of people that were smoking. And I said, give me a, all right, all right, I've got something to talk about. Um, I said, hey, what we're doing, I, I don't have an issue with it, but I, there's some older people, they don't get it. Would you refrain from smoking on church campus for the sake of these people just to, to build that bridge, to be in harmony? And you know what they all did? Sure. I can wait to smoke till I'm off church campus, right? And those old people are at the end of the driveway, like, waiting for you to leave. All right, put that butt in your mouth and start smoking. Right, right. What are you willing to just say, I don't need to do this because I love you. I love you more than I love this thing. I love your conscience more than I love my convictions or lack of convictions. I don't know. But it's all about others. You have not been saved for you. You've been saved for somebody else. And all God's people said, amen. Let me close with this. The last point and we're done. Um, notice the church, the emotion of salvation is gladness, not guilt. Notice when they read this letter, they're all unified. And the church, it says, celebrated. They were glad because they heard a message that had been discussed and debated and argued over, and the fact that they had come to agreement and they are unified and they are harmonious with one another, the church celebrated this. And now, here's what I'm not going to take personally, the fact that we have read the same material, talked about the same stuff, and no one's necessarily celebrating right now. That's okay, because a couple of hours from now, God may get a hold of your heart and say, celebrate. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, Yeah! <laughs> I can restrict freedoms for you because I understand now salvation has, has to do with me. Yeah, but the, the moment I'm saved, I'm good. Now I can serve you the rest of my life. Will 2023 be a year that is defined by submission and service on your part? I'm going to tell you right now, we become a culture that that buys into what I'm sharing, and I'm not, I'm not saying you're going to buy into it. I hope you do. Where we mutually submit to one another, and we're willing to say, my convictions don't matter because your conscience is more important. Maybe then, John 13, the world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. We become a force that is unstoppable. I don't know. What do you think, church? You buy it? Yeah, maybe you need some time to think on it. But I guarantee you, at some point, you're going to text me and be like, I'm celebrating. I'm excited. I'm so glad we got into this. Oh, God is good, you guys. Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Thankful for you. Happy New Year. Maybe you have your marching orders for this year. I'm praying for you. Pray for me. We get to do this together, and I'm super thrilled about that. Love you. Let's stand. Let's pray. Who's getting steak? Who's going to get steak today? <laughs> Dick, you're going to get steak? Great. You're taking me with you, all right? <laughs> Father, thank you for joy. Thank you for the spirit of celebration and excitement. Thank you that you have entered this context. Your spirit is present. Your word has been open, Lord. And I pray that there's been an engagement with our hearts and our spirits today that will yield fruit today and forever. Lord, help us to be men and women 
who understand what is worth fighting for. I pray that we would be men and women who are so quick to pursue relationship that we're willing to set our rights aside so that someone can taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord, forgive us for the ways we have really dug in our heels on certain things and, and really made topics eternal topics when they're not eternal topics. I think we're all guilty of that to some degree. May, may the, 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 the message of Romans 14 be what it's about. Do we think the kingdom is about politics and vaccinations and presidents and, and minimum wage and, and Russia? And you tell us, no, the kingdom is about joy and righteousness. Lord, remind us of, this, of these things. Compel us to love one another ruthlessly and recklessly. That's how you've loved us. Thank you, God, for being our God. Thank you for the, the example of Christ who came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. May the Spirit apply the truths we've uncovered would you direct our steps, and would you, Father, be glorified in all we do and say now and forever? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. Enjoy that steak, all right? <laughs>